All right. Welcome to the Sumer Sports Show. I'm Eric Eager. I'm one of the VPs at Sumer Sports. I'm joined by the CEO of Sumer Sports, Thomas Dimitrov. We're here to recap week 14 in the only way that we know how to do it here at Sumer. Thomas, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited. We have an on-site with our internal scouting staff, which we can talk about a little bit later. But to be around all the scouting people who have a lot of interest in data, watching you, Eric Eager, in there interacting with guys like Mike Mayock and John Idzik, um, you know, to me, I think it's great to watch you interact with our scouting group because they have a great deal of respect for you and your intelligence, and you also understand football. That's always a good mix for football people, right? They want to know the data people has have some interest in football at some level and experience. Yeah, for sure. It's it's a lot of fun and it's always cool to, you know, I've gotten the pleasure of being able to pick your brain for a few years now. And it's it's just it adds so much to the, you know, it adds so much. I mean, not, you know, not to peek underneath the hood at all, but like the fact of the matter is, is like any problems we have with the data are almost always not data problems. They're football problems. Right. And so if you if you go and, you know, make sure that the football is sound, the, the, the solutions will generally speaking to your data problems will go away. And so um, it, I think we'll even <laughs> we'll be even more turbocharged in that now that we have so many people who know uh, football at such a deep level. Inferno 214, by the way, how hot do you think Beach to Seed is right now? It's not hot, but we will be talking Kansas City. I can't believe that we have to talk about how hot Brett Beach's seat is <laughs> 10 months after he uh, won his second Super Bowl as the Chiefs DM. Uh, but I can understand the frustration for Chiefs fans. We will certainly talk about that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's that's a – we will talk Chiefs uh, versus Buffalo because that game was super compelling. But this would not be a Sumer Sports Show Monday show if we did not talk about our hometown Falcons here, they lose 29, 25. Um, what do we, where do we want to start? Do we want to start where you mess, you know, where Baker Mayfield, you know, got you in the doubting phase for the first three and a half quarters of the game. Then he comes up big with a couple nice corner routes, uh, one to Chris Godwin and then one to Kate Otten for the game winning touchdown. Um, I, look, it was just a good game, Eric. I mean, I mean, in no. the end, it was a it was a back and forth game. There's no right or wrong, no no cheering on one side or another. I don't want the Atlanta fans thinking I'm cheering against. What I want to see is good football. I want to see good decision making. I want to see good team building because in order for Arthur Blank to ever win his Super Bowl, which he deserves to win for himself and the city, things have to be falling into place, right? You need to make sure that you're really strategic about you're putting it together. So it's really interesting to watch this division, right? We talked about it. So it's a good lead in on it, right? This division right now, I mean, now they go from leading number one in the division, right, to second, like that, which I didn't know that was actually going to happen. I didn't yeah, know. Yeah, we had, we had the Falcons with over a 60% chance to win the division going into the week. And now, now this is a little bit different than the market, right? Uh, the betting markets have, uh, if, if you look at, at my account, the betting markets have the Bucks as a slight favorite. At plus 175, the Falcons are um, in that one, you know, 80 range, and then the and then the Saints are right behind them at about uh, one set 185, 190. Our numbers at Sumer Sports actually are a little bit more, or a little higher on the on the uh, New Orleans Saints. So I think some people who've seen me tweet about Derek Carr are maybe a little bit surprised there, but we actually have Tampa Bay at 39 percent, New Orleans at at 32 percent, and Atlanta at 28 percent, and a lot of that is just schedule driven, right? The the schedule is much easier, I think, for the Saints than it is for the other two teams. So even though they haven't been necessarily as impressive, in fact, uh, I think you can make the case that this is maybe one of the more underachieving teams all year. We do, we are more bullish on the Saints than uh, than some people are moving forward. Um, but yeah, vis-a-vis these two teams, right? I, I think the Bucks, you know defensively were pretty good yesterday. I think the Falcons have a decent opportunity at times to, to deploy some like, you know, really explosive weapons. And for the most part, they held the Bashan Robinsons and the Kyle Pitts in check. They, they gave up 172 yards to Drake London, and that was a pretty good game by him. But for the most part, they did their part. And I think if you're the Falcons, I think that you're going to want to have some of those big plays, you know, to the, you know, the, at the, uh, 
the final drive and things like that, you're going to want to have those back. And if you're Desmond Ritter, you're going to want to have that interception inside the 10 yard line back. Yeah. I mean, you're going to want to have the sack, the uh, sack for a, for a safety back. That was an important time to your point, Drake London, man, he, he was standing out yesterday. It was fun to watch him. I'm still trying to get my head around where Pitts is in all of this. Right. I mean, we all love a running back. I think he had he left less than 45 yards, I think, yesterday. You know, teams are really focused on that. You know, you know what we're saying. I guess what I'm saying there is there's two teams that are battling like crazy. Tampa's trying to figure out the quarterback situation. I called you. We won't get into the details on it. But when I called you and I, I mentioned that I would fire you if you were if you were recommending, <laughs> uh, you know, a quarterback as such, you, you just were kind of quiet for about a minute. And I was thinking, I hope I didn't offend you. I was no, always no, I think I knew you were joking, but like, uh, but it is, it's funny because, you know, and we've had this discussion before, right? We talked about Jordan Love last week, by the way, if you go to sumersports.com, um, we have an article up about what it's going to look like for the Packers if they want to extend Jordan Love. He has another opportunity tonight against the New York Giants on the road to kind of continue to make his case to be the Packers starter moving forward. Um, but like, when, the number of quarterbacks in the NFL that are of starter caliber is just not very high anymore. Right. And so when you look at like Baker Mayfield, like I, whether we like it or not, Baker Mayfield's probably going to get a one year deal for anywhere from 10 to 15 million to be a team's bridge starting quarterback for a long time, because at least, you know, when you think about being able to keep the thing on the tracks, it's not good. It's not pretty. It's not what you're going to win a Super Bowl with. But right now in the NFL, when you have so many, I mean, you, you know, we're going to talk to uh, Mike Mayock in a little bit here, but like you look at back at in Vegas, three nothing game, that's two backup quarterbacks dueling it out indoors to a three nothing game. That's just, in, it's incredibly hard to stomach. And so a lot of teams are going to prefer the Derek Cars and the Baker Mayfields and even the Desmond Ritters, even though to our eyes, they don't, they seem like dead ends, right? Like Baker Mayfield feels like a dead end as a quarterback option in the NFL even though week to week he he makes some plays that impress us at times. Impress us, but then in the end, you know, you are they really pulling it off? And and what's going to be interesting for this division, then we can move on to your next game, I know. And thank you for bringing it up. I know you're not always I watch good. I watch every Falcons game because I know like they're I well for one, um, you know, our models like, you know, like the Saints and Bucks. So I always like look at the Falcons to see if they're actually going to win that division because I, I can't believe it with my eyes. Uh, so I got to make sure, um, you know, I got to watch along. But, you know, those three teams at six and seven, I I, I feel bad. I'm like I, I tweeted out the the odds that FanDuel had for the to win that division. And I, I subtweeted. I said, imagine looking at this and being Matt Ryan, right, where you're in years of like, you're one of the best quarterbacks in the whole league. And obviously you as well being the person who had the best drafts collectively from 2008 to 2020. Imagine looking at those, at that division, you're looking at Drew Brees and all those great players. You're looking at Cam Newton and all those great players. And, and then, you know, even Jameis had his moments, of course, in 2016, that they had a winning record and you had to fight and claw just to get a wild card in that division. And now, you know, if you put one foot in front of the other, I think that your old Falcons teams probably would have won that division by five games. And, and it's sort of weird to see. Let me ask you this before we move on. Which one in this division, OK, NFC South, has the best odds of landing Bill Belichick? That's a tough one. I only ask. I actually don't team. think it's that hard. I think it's Carolina. Oh, you do? OK. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, like. Let's talk economics of the NFL for a second, right? So everybody's looking at Washington. I think understandably Josh Harris is, you know, trying to, you know, after years and years of the Dan Snyder stuff and trying to project confidence, there's also that cool little quirk that Vince Lombardi coached in Washington for a year after his time with Green Bay. So there's sort of this idea of like, you know, hey, kind of follow the same path. Um, but Washington, like the 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 – Josh Harris, I don't think has as many resources as David Tepper does. And so, and so if you're thinking about, you know, where are these like hall of fame caliber coaches going? Like Sean Payton went to Denver because the Waltons have that kind of money. Right. And, and that, and that's cash that doesn't have to go against the cap. So like the t teams that want to pay up can really pay up. Well, I, I, look, I think Carolina has the money to do it. I think Carolina does, but I think there are other teams in this division who are right potentially for a Hall of Fame 
and a Super Bowl winning coach. And I do believe, I've said this many times, I believe Bill can bring a Super Bowl to a team within three years. And I do also believe, let's just uh, we'll stay on your team right now, Carolina. There's a guy out there from another team that might come available. And sometimes he's been there a long time. If Mike Tomlin comes available with David Tepper's connections to Pittsburgh. Oh, good call. He has a great, uh, great respect for him. Mm -hmm. Maybe Mike just needs a change. I'm not, I, I don't yeah. say that. I like Mike a lot. I think he's a damn good coach. And I think he can also has the ability to win a Super Bowl where they are. I'm just saying it's going to be an interesting division to see if there's going to be movement uh, with this division with some uh, potentially. And I'm saying with Bill, I have no idea whether he's coming out. I'm not speaking to that. I'm just saying if they ever do come out, there's going to be some coaches out there that teams are going to slap. They're going to snap up and they're, they're going to say, you know, I like the idea of this young guy that I don't even know talks a whole bunch, the Ben Johnson of the world. And maybe I bring in someone who is a proven winner. That, that could be the case. Well, and, and the honest to God's truth. And I, I like Ben Johnson and we did a lot. We've done we do a ton of modeling on head coaching, but like the sneaky secret is Detroit, the, the offensive coordinating for last year's Lions was a they the the numbers look better last year. I'll just say that. So, like, I you know, I think golf has regressed a little bit this year. I think that they've been healthier, even though the offense hasn't been quite as efficient last yesterday. Now, uh, props to Matt Eberflus, right? They, they got that Bears team doing a really good job. Um, but you got held to 13 points by a Bears defense that no one thinks is very good. And so I, I wonder about that one. Um, and that's why, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, you take a lot of we, we look at a guy like Brandon Staley and we ask, why did he take a job so fast? Why didn't he let, let his, his steak marinate a little bit longer? And I think we see the answer, right? Because you, you don't take that opportunity. You go back and maybe your stock falls. I think about even like at the quarterback position, Matt, Matt Liner. If Matt Liner comes out his junior year of USC, he's a top three pick. Comes out his senior year, he's a top he would pick tenth, and and like that's real stuff, right? And and so I, that's interesting. I I don't know if the Saints necessarily will would go for Belichick. Um, I think the Falcons. It depends upon how they finish, but I don't necessarily know if they're going to move on from. You know, I don't think that they're anywhere. Like, I don't see them moving on from Arthur Smith quite yet. Um, and so I, when you said Panthers, I actually thought of Sean McDermott. But, of course, they got, as a segue, a very a very crucial win yesterday in Kansas City. Thomas, this is the fourth consecutive game that the Sean McDermott Bills in the regular season have won in Arrowhead. Now, of course, they've lost two playoff games there. Um, but they're, they're four and, oh, the last four regular season games there. 20 to 17, it was a game, obviously, that everybody's going to remember the Kadarius Tony offsides, the creativity from K Travis Kelsey. You know, you know, I'm a Chiefs fan, so I watch these games. I'm at the end, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, like, everybody's going to focus on the Tony thing, but I look at the drop passes, I look at the penalties, I look at the missed tackles, I look at, and I just, I don't think the Chiefs deserve to win that game. I, so I'm not all that upset about the penalty, you know, the calls and stuff. This team doesn't leave itself any room for error. And so when they make errors, you know, they're top 10 in terms of penalties, top 10 in terms of turnovers as far as differential. Like the Bills came in there and they were the better football team yesterday. Like that, to me, I think that, you know, good work by McDermott, I know is a rough week for him as far as that story that came out and everything. What did you, what was your takeaway from that game? I, I just, what I do want to know is uh, like, first of all, what was your take? on Mahomes and his blow up at the end. And has that happened? Have you seen that by the way? No. So so I actually so obviously it's a bad look and I think going up to Josh Allen and saying and talking, you know, that's not a great look. That I don't like that. Mahomes this season has deflected blame almost the entire time. You know, Marquez Valdez Scantling dropped the touchdown. He said, you know, I got to throw that ball better. <laughs> you know, he's he's always he's shouldered a lot of the load on this team and I don't think he's playing as well as normal. Like, I don't think he's played as well as he did a season ago. So he, you know, he, he's regressed a little some, I don't think Andy Reed yet has really pulled out all the stops. And so I think that they're kind of ironing stuff out. This team kind of reminds me of the 2018 Patriots where like they lose, you know, they, they're not quite there. They're Super Bowl caliber, but they're not kicking teams as ass. Um, but Mah I think like, 
it all bubbled up, right? A year where you're dealing with kind of suboptimal receivers all the time. Um, your offense is not humming. Like if you would have told me, okay, Chiefs get the ball down three with a with two minutes left and two timeouts. Two years ago, I'm like, this game's over. Patrick is going to go and score a touch. And like now, I have no faith that they can move the ball like that. How 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 difficult was it not having Pacheco? What did you think their run game was? I mean, yeah, what? I mean, I thought Clyde edwards helaire actually ran yeah. the ball like for him, you know. And obviously, he's a first round pick, so you sort of expect that. But like, I mean, edwards helaire I guess it only was 3.5 a carry. They got 4.8 right. out of McKinnon and a touchdown. Tony gave him 16 on two carries, so it was not quite as good or as physical. But I don't think that was the problem. I, I mean, penalties. You know, the the right tackle continues to give them penalties, and you know, at wide receiver they have drops and. You know, the other part, and, and like I said, I'm a Mahomes is my favorite player. Like, I mean, he's the best player in the league, I think. So I'm not breaking any ground here. But like first and 10, right after the Rasheed Rice catch, he one hopped Rasheed Rice to put that ball in field goal range. Like, I I just don't like, and maybe, maybe you could expect, like this team is built so that Mahomes is, if Mahomes is error free, they're going to win. And when he's not error free, like it's just, it's a coin flip. And, and I, so I get worried again, just they didn't run the ball quite as effectively as normal, but I think a lot of it was on the passing game. And that's why I think that, you know, he eventually bubbled up and said like this game was the defense for the chiefs last night played a tremendous football. You know, the defense put it on their play. They only gave up 20 uh, and Mahomes is probably really irritated that they couldn't take advantage and beat one of their rivals. I know I've mentioned this before, how many people out there worry that the distraction element is there? All the commercials. I'm not saying they're doing it now, right? That was a big discussion about it. Whether it was with us or someone else, it was like, look, if they're doing commercials during the season, that's one thing. Off season doesn't matter. But off season, off season does, you know, can be a, a pull. When you're when your focus is on a lot of stuff, every time I turn around, some of the big one of the big studs is is doing a commercial, along with a head coach, right? Who I have a great deal of respect for. It's just it's it's a different approach. You never obviously saw that with Bill Belichick and the Patriot group, right? And I don't think you've seen it with a lot of people. Like they kicked into gear, they have the personality to do it. How much does that play into this from your perspective? Because from mine, my head goes there, right? I would beat myself up over things like this, wondering how much did this is this really distracting? And can we push it aside? You're not gonna push it aside because those commercials are coming all the way through, whether you're in the playoffs. And or in the Super Bowl, right? It's gonna be, it's gonna be crazy. How much is out there? How much, you know? You you also have Kelsey with his his relationship situation. There is a lot there. That's not easy to deal with. Well, and and two years ago when they were really having their struggles, it was Patrick Mahomes' his brother, and he was getting in trouble. And like you just you do wonder, right? I mean, last season they did the quarterback documentary, and it seemed like they got everything in order. But like so. Part of me is like, well, I don't know how much everybody's going through, so I, I I can't really necessarily judge. But like, it does seem, and and it is also one of those things, Thomas. When everything's going well, you ignore everything. Yep. And yep. and when everything's not going well, you don't. So um, we do have a special guest coming in, by the way, sure as do. we as we transition. We have Mike Mayock. There he is. Mike, Mike Mayock, welcome to the show. Uh, how many guests have we had, Thomas, with with you on? We had we've had Mike. We had uh, Jack Easterby, um, but welcome to the show, um, Mike. How are you doing? I'm doing great. This is a pretty cool setup you guys have here. Yeah, it, it's awesome. Thomas has a, a great vision. He's got way better taste than me, as you can tell by his outfit versus my outfit. Uh, he, he's just so much swaggier than I am, uh, and as such, he, he came up with this. So, uh, Mike, you know, former general manager of the Raiders, uh, was an analyst, uh, you know, in the draft from NFL Network, and and and. You know, I've followed your work for a long time. This has been a this is a great honor. Honor's mine. Have you seen Thomas's socks today? <laughs> I mean, you want to talk I, about I don't. I can't even get there. I've been in such awe of the rest of the getup. Really, you know, we had the we had a lot of uh, really cool talk, stuff. Yeah, you talk no. swaggy. Look at the glasses. No, yeah. Like the, I honestly, honestly, God, it's funny you say that about the socks. I got up this morning. I couldn't find. I saw green socks, red socks. I don't know. And I'm like, this was my only pair of blue, and it had stripes all up and down it which has kind of gone by the wayside now. People aren't having his fancy socks. But we're not here to talk about socks or glasses. We are here to tap in to my guy here. Like this guy, we'll get into it in a minute here. But just so everyone knows, Mike Mayock, 
what we're doing at Sumer Sports right now and Mike Mayock's involvement is something that we are extremely proud of. And, and Mike's interaction with us from a, obviously a very, very intelligent and insightful football perspective, also moving along with us, talking a lot about data and the direction of data, which is not easy for some of us who consider ourselves as old school, right? Yep. 100%. But but we, we you know we're all learning and growing from guys like you, Eric. We can yep. listen to guys like you and be really edified. But let's talk let's talk a little bit of Philadelphia Eagles that game. But I would love to circle up back on this before we cut off here. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like let's uh, yeah I let's let's talk first about what we're doing here, right? So we have at Sumer Sports uh, we have our own our own scouting department, um, which is different. Like obviously, I have you know, roots at PFF where, you know, we have data analysts kind of collecting data and, and producing a grade. This is a little bit different and it, uh, much different. This is sort of exactly what, you know, NFL teams do. This is exactly what uh, different services like Blesto and, and others do, um, where you guys are watching film and you're putting a grade on a player. You're adding that that context um, that is difficult for pure data analysts to arrive at. And, you, you know, what I think about when I think about this richness of data is like from either from like a, you know, obviously a forward facing, like sort of gaming perspective, there's just so much there to be gleaned from it. But obviously for, you know, the, for teams who are trying to look for a second, you know, opinion on a player um, I, I think that this is incredibly valuable stuff. And obviously selfishly for me, uh, just being able to interact with you and see what you guys see, uh, even, even from a, you know, a, 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 the view that I have, it's so, it's so incredibly valuable. And, and, you know, to get you guys, I think when you guys are talking to each other about players, there's just so much I, I can pick up on. You know, what's kind of cool, though, Ark, and, and you, you touched on it on one side of it. The flip side is being around you and the data guys opens up doors that Thomas and I maybe hadn't looked at before. And the way I look at Sumer is that it's, it's kind of the proper marriage between respecting football OK, so that, that we are putting grades, human beings judging human beings. And it's, yes. hard, it's hard to get away from that piece of it. Yet we're also taking a, a, something driven by analytics and forcing us all to open our minds a little bit to try and get to the best answer, not a answer, the best answer. And I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. There's so much. Yeah, I, I even think about, you know, like, for example, on our website at SumerSports.com, we have, you know, statistics for every single player. And the leader right now in the clubhouse for what's called expected points in the passing game is Brock Purdy, right? And I think that old, you know, analytics, right, the, the, from you know, my perspective, it's really hard to untangle what Brock Purdy is doing from what Kyle Shanahan is doing. And so, you know, I think if somebody has a naive view, they're going to say, well, Brock Purdy is the best quarterback in the NFL. And, you know, from you guys' perspective, you're able to go in and look at the traits and, and you're, you're able to look at what has had, you know, success, you know, you know, front to back in the NFL. Like when they do this, you know, this, this sort of set of traits can transcend scheme. It can transcend surrounding talent. It can transcend all of the stuff that when you just look at the, the statistics, those are contextual pieces that maybe get lumped in too much. Or if you try to do too much, like if I just dismiss every quarterback that's ever played with Kyle Shanahan, I'm going to miss out on, you know, Thomas's guy, Matt Ryan, who was pretty good no matter what scheme he was in. And he was just a little bit better with Kyle. And so there's just, there's a lot to do to your point of like, you know, but at the same time, there's, there are obviously going to be players you know, I think about like Elvis Doomerville. I think about guys in the past who like didn't London Fletcher. Now Ivan Pace for the Vikings. If people watch like a 5'10 linebacker whose yeah. statistics in college were amazing, but he doesn't necessarily have the same traits that some of the other guys who have played linebacker at a high level in the NFL have done. And so to your point, Mike, it's just this perfect marriage uh, of, of the two systems where you can sort of take the average of the two and say like, look, traditional scouts are really good at evaluating, for example, safeties. Analytics have been notoriously awful at it. Okay, so let's let's see if we can bridge the gap here versus, you know, a position like I would even say like edge. Analytics is fairly good at 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 coming up with who's going to be a good edge player. Is he big, fast, or strong? Can he is he productive in college? Okay, he's probably going to be a pretty good NFL player. And so we can sort of like weigh different things different ways. And again, having you guys' knowledge, having our knowledge on the analytics side, uh, I think is a is a fierce combo. You know. You mentioned a name, Brock Purdy. People are, are 
people are on all sides of that fence with with what he is or he isn't because of Shanahan and that whole coaching tree. And I think it's a great conversation because one of the hardest things you you mentioned safeties. I was an NFL safety, not a very good one, but I played safety in the NFL. I find it hard to to really do a great job on safeties because the first thing you have to do is define what you are going to ask from them for a particular team, yeah. for a particular scheme. What are you looking for? It's easier to kind of find free safeties, center fielders. But what this six foot three guy, uh, Duggar, 222 pounds. Played Division Two. Played Division Two. What was he? Lenoir Ryan. Ryan, yeah. And I'm sitting there going, this is a big, good looking, tough son of a gun. Where does he fit? You got to get the right fit. Brock Purdy started a thousand games in college, was highly accurate. And if you put his tape on, the common denominator is his anticipation and his accuracy. Yep. That is so hard to find on tape sometimes with some of these big, strong arm guys. Yet in college football today, I mean, I can't tell you how many tapes I've done to get ready for our draft mm-hmm. meetings where 90% of the throws are within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. Yep. Yeah. Like, how do you, how do you, you got to look through hours and hours of tape to find one anticipation throw. Yes. And then how do you grade that? How do you impute that? How do you, and so anyway, that's a long way of saying that was, yeah. I mean, you, you bring up such a good point. Like it, like we had this issue when I was at PFF with Makai Becton, because I, I created this thing called true pass blocking sets, which is basically you know, dropbacks longer than two and a half seconds, no screens, no play actions, like all the, like literally are you, and, and Thomas sees me in the office goofing around, but like, are you literally kick stepping to a depth, right? right? And actually, and actually pass protecting. Right. And, you know, Becton had all these great traits, but like when you actually took his Louisville tape, it was like a hundred snaps, right? You look at like Trey Lance out of North Dakota state, like for one, you have to numeric, you know, you have to numerically evaluate the ta- the talent for and against, uh, you know, in that realm, but also like Trey Lance at North Dakota State had maybe 20 to 50 dropbacks when trailing. So when the other team knows you have to throw, how many times are you actually getting an eval on this player? And so then, you know, so there, there's a there the information we think about data, big data. We think about all these snaps a player gets, but a lot a lot of times the decision makers like you guys are making these choices based upon a small amount of information. That that's been gathered. And these are, you know, you don't want to ignore them, obviously, like Steve McNair, for example, Hall of Fame kind of caliber player at Alcorn State. So you're pretty glad Houston didn't, you know, pass up on him. But but for a lot of other players, I think the Niners probably would have wished they would have taken a quarterback who had maybe a little bit more information added to him. You, you know, as you're talking, I'm trying to think the tape I've, I've watched this year, there's a high level quarterback. One of the games I did, 31 of his 33 throws were within eight yards of the line of scrimmage. 30, yeah. And the other two were <laughs> over 21 yards, and he was over two. And he had nothing between 11 and 20. Nothing where he had to drive a ball yeah. outside the numbers or, or anticipate in behind a linebacker. And you sit there and you go, okay, he's a good athlete, and that was fun to watch, but where am I? Yes. Yeah. I got to find some more throws to, to justify whether or not I think at a certain level, he'll ever anticipate or be able to drive a ball like that. And that's a great point as we really start digging into personnel. Uh, was that Bo Nix? Is that who you were talking yeah, about? Yeah, we have we have our listeners, uh, Mike, who are who are who are are trying to guess who you were talking about. And so I posted a couple yeah, of them. He doesn't want to talk about it yet. Yeah, right? of course. So that, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, to your point, like Justin Herbert's tape was like that, right? When you actually went and looked at the last few games of or like the last few seasons of Oregon. Like I, I can't remember what percentage but it was a significant number that were underneath, but then of course you, you ask the question: Is that is that a bad coaching job on their part, where you have this robo quarterback who can hit all these doubles? We could do this for like five hours now. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. That's right now, yeah. now yeah. I remember meeting with the Justin Herbert, and my whole conversation was driving towards Justin. You got this huge arm; you can fit it anywhere. And no disconnect, no um, disrespect towards their offense. They're a run first team. Okay. Yeah. They have an attitude yeah. of running the freaking football. I just did all of Bo Nix's tape and all of, you know, the, both those uh, Washington, Oregon games. Oregon wants to run the football, they want to throw the ball laterally, horizontally. Right. So, how do you evaluate that kid? So, Justin Herbert, I'm sitting here with, I had 50 um, 
snaps ready to go for him when we were going to sit down. Yeah. I had 50 pass plays laid out, and it was almost all where I thought he was too conservative, where he wouldn't rip it with that. So it was kind of like a um, stutter go on one side, okay, with a seam on the other versus single high. So all he had to do was kind of move the safety yeah, yeah. toward the stutter go and come back in his job. Now, the wide receiver's job is to beat the corner to the inside, inside leverage. His job is to fit it between the corner and the safety. So he's got to beat the safety. And I'm looking, I, I got the tape, and I'm like, tell me what you're thinking. Yes. You looked right at it, and you checked it down. Why? And those things are what make, to me, scouting so fascinating, yet also so human-based at times yeah. that I actually welcome some of the data that supports yeah. it some of the other stuff. Yeah. I mean, the data can really help Tom. I want to expound on this a little bit, but like the data can really help you ask the questions, right? Like, cause I, you know, I'm a fan of all football. Like I watch every game of, like, I, you know, and I, but you can get these biases, right? You can, you can develop them. You're like, Oh my God, you see one guy rip a post pattern. You're like, this guy is a, a daring quarterback. And then you look at the data and to your point, like it's like, well, why are 70% of his passes within negative five to 10 yards downfield? Like, and so you, you go to ask that question, and then you know this gets to a lot of scheme. You can't kill a kid yeah. to do what his coach is asking him to do. Yeah, and, is what exactly. So then, yeah. So then you look at his, you look at other players who play in that scheme, and if they're doing the same thing, then you know, and that's why like a lot of metrics are what are called above expectation. So basically, you take mathematically, you look at down distance, you look at scheme type, you look at all protection type. You look at all those and then you say, what percentage of passes are more than 10 yards in this offense? And maybe his number's low, but his number's higher than other players who play those same. And so you can kind of tease that out. But even then, there's so much movement now in college football coaches and all this stuff where you really have to do your digging to make sure that you're asking the right questions. Because to your point, a lot of these players are just doing what they're asked. And especially at the college level where, you know, with NIL, it's maybe going to be a little different down the stretch. But in the NFL, some guys have a little bit more autonomy because they're the ones making all the money versus in college. You're just trying. You're, I mean, you're trying to make sure that your coach tells the Thomas Dimitrovs and the Mike Mayocks of the world, like, hey, this is a good kid. He'll he'll follow directions. He's not a he's not going to go off the off the script and stuff. And so there's there's less autonomy than I think people believe. Look, Drake May is a guy this year that I find intriguing for several of the same reasons that I did with Justin Herbert. And I think he's ultra conservative. I think they throw a lot laterally in that. And then at other times, I can pull clips out and see him drive the ball down the field. It's really fun. Who was it against? Um, North Carolina State, I want to say. They got behind, yeah. and he was forced to have to rip the ball in the second half. That's the kind of tape you got to go find, right? They're yeah. down 14 or 17. He can't just rely on his legs, which is what he wants to do. Right. So now he's forcing and anticipating and throwing and trying to throw back shoulders, throw guys open. That's what I want to see, because there are some guys in the draft that do it naturally. Go look at the USC kid and watch him run around. Watch Michael Penix. You know, there are different guys that you can see any of that tape. But, Eric, to your point, when you don't have as big a subset quantity of, of comparatives, it's really hard as a scout to bang the table and say, yeah, I know he can make that throw and he can do it in the NFL on a consistent basis. Let's let's talk two quarterbacks in a game, Dallas, Philly. I want I we need to get this is a well, very because I, I really like this discussion vis-a-vis -vis these two guys, right? Because Jalen Hurts coming out, right? There was there were hit, I mean, when you look at just raw numbers, his one year with uh Lincoln Riley in Oklahoma. You're talking about a guy, great completion percentage, great yards per attempt, all this kind of stuff. But there was always questions about processing. Like, Mike, we do this cool thing at, at Sumer, um, which we, we take scouting reports and the words that go into them. So all the great work that you guys do. And we compare the words literally between the players. And so you have like with a guy like Jalen Hurts, you have maybe somebody might not slap a great grade on him, but they might say things about him in the notes that are similar to other great players. So for example, with Hertz, and I know this isn't necessarily apropos anymore, but at the time it made, you know, they were comparing him to Deshaun Watson, the leadership kind of capabilities at Clemson, winning the title and, and going into Houston and having leads in the playoffs and all this stuff. And like that, that's kind of been what I've seen. Like, I don't, so the, in, in this case, the scouting report kind of rings true, not great in terms of like anticipation. I don't think, 
but has the athleticism and the leadership capabilities where he can carry this team to a 10 and three mark. And what I think is really cool, guys, is when I watch Dak Prescott now with the Cowboys, I see him taking a little bit more leadership. I think Mike, you know, Mike McCarthy takes over that play calling role from uh, Kellen Moore. And he's put some of that responsibility on the shoulders of Prescott. And I think over the past two months, what you've really seen is a quarterback kind of coming of age. So we're talking, interestingly enough, we're talking about a second round pick and a fourth round pick, Mm -hmm. right? Dak was in the fourth and Jalen was a two. Um, What impressed me about Jalen in the process, we interviewed him at at, um, at the combine and it was less about the tape and more about the kid. The kid was one of the most genuine young men. It's hard to get an impression with the amount of time you're given. So I wanted to spend some more time with him. Um, one of the most genuine kids, how he handled the demotion at Alabama to Tua um, with class, dignity, professionalism. You could see him being the face of a franchise. Okay, so kind of on the soft side of it, away from the data-driven stuff, you, you're really impressed with the kid and what kind of leader you think he can become. That's point number one. Point number two is, okay, what kind of scheme did he come out of? You know, when you talk about anticipation and driving the ball, you know, a lot of RPOs, right? A lot of either this or that kind of decisions, which don't lend itself as much towards the, quote, traditional West Coast or whatever you want to go go towards. Um, But what has developed with the Eagles, and I live in Philly and I've seen them practice a lot and I know their people pretty well, is they build a system around him, which is what good coaches do, right? What does he do well? This year, what I found intriguing was I was at training camp several times, and I'm thinking to myself, the first thing defenses are going to do after his success last year is they're going to take away the planned quarterback run, okay? That was kind of their wild card last year that made them special. You know, they had the RPO game. They had – uh, great wideouts. They had a good running attack. But on top of all that, you have to account for the quarterback as an extra gap in your in your run scheme. OK, so what happened the first three or four games of the year, I think it was New England week one. New England defense played really good against them and they struggled and they took away his run game, plan, the planned quarterback run. Mm-hmm. And then the first three or four weeks of the season, people are going, what's wrong with Jalen Hurts? And I'm like, well, you know, they've taken away a big part of what the Eagles do. They're going to have to, they got a new co- coordinator on defense. They've got some different pieces. They got to figure some things out. And then he gets hurt and he continues to play. Right. So to me, they're still on offense. Every team's taking the plan quarterback run away to an extent. He's beat up with the knee. You could see him with Dallas last night. I mean, they're running that uh, Kelsey out in front of him, him behind, and he's just sliding whenever he could pick up six or seven. So those 17s and 18s are now sixes and sevens, okay? And teams have a much better idea what to do to slow them down a little bit, and I do believe he's hurt. A lot of people are questioning whether or not he can process and get to two, three, but that offense isn't really set up to do all of that. Dak Prescott, to your point, I apologize for this long answer. No, it's all, it, this is great info. This is stuff that, of course – uh, Thomas and I have hinted at it a lot of the show, but it's obviously great to get confirmation on a lot of this. Um, but Dak Prescott, yep. to your point, Eric, which I think is a great one, is Mike McCarthy takes over, gives him even more ownership of that offense, and they have a shared vision, a common vision. They struggled early in the year, right? They had two or three bad games in a row. They got spanked by San Francisco. You know, Philly beat – that Philly tape, by the way, is the first one first tape I watched every snap both both sides of the ball that was a hell of a tape to watch and the right tackle from Dallas got beat up a little bit he struggled steal um you know that caused Dak some problems with getting the ball out um 88's a bad dude you know that that tight end is a developing tight end first um I think he's Barry Alvarez is uh there's nothing there's nothing better than a than a tight end that's willing to run up the seam and get cracked right like he that that guy is fearless, and Dak will throw the seam better than any any quarterback in the league, I think. Yeah, and then you got a run game, you got an O line, you know. Both those two teams are similar on offense in that the quarterbacks are really running the show, but they can run the ball. They have devastating wideouts, and when healthy, you know, the Eagles got Goddard back last night. 
they, Dallas has Ferguson. So I think offensively, you can throw those two teams up against the wall and say, yeah, schematically they're a little different, but they're built in a similar fashion. Dominant offensive line, really good skill, skill guys, and a quarterback that is a great leader that was not a first-round pick with physical traits. Kind of intriguing, right? Well, and I think especially in this NFL where Thomas and I have had this discussion for a long time now that, you know, Matt Ryan's retired, Drew Brees is retired, Philip Rivers is retired, Ben Roethlisberger, Brady, as as you start to see these, and they're, it's not one for one. It's not Herbert comes in and Brady leaves. There's fewer great guys that are coming into the league than are leaving. It's intriguing. Yes, Mike, you like, you can you win a Super Bowl now without one of those truly elite guys? And especially, you know, since 2012, the only Super Bowl that did not include a quarterback making the, a team built around a quarterback making rookie contract money was when Thomas's Falcons and and uh, Thomas's old team, the Patriots, made the Super Bowl in '16. Every other Super Bowl has included at least one one quarterback for whom a team built around a rookie deal. Yeah. That's not that's not probably going to happen as much anymore because you can have some of these guys who aren't like the on you guys' scale the nines right playing quarterback but are still making nine-ish money like you can still do it as long as the coaching staff and the scheme is willing to marry those things well and you're seeing that with Hertz and you're seeing with Dak those guys are both making good money now but you're still able to be a Super Bowl contender because to your point they build the entire airplane around them and I want to sort of get to this because both of you guys were team builders in the NFL there is so much value in what the Eagles have, which is continuity, right? And and a shared vision, how we can build a team around a quarterback who's not perfect, because he knows that if he swings and misses on a Jalen Rager or he, you know, he doesn't hit on, you know, uh Andre Dillard, he's not losing his job, right? Like there's 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 an element of being able to experiment and you know apply the analytics when it's unconventional, all those things when you have that kind of long-term stability. And I think that being able to win with a quarterback who's not Patrick Mahomes or Josh Allen or Justin Herbert, I think that's one of the ways in which you can is when you have institutional stability and you're able to sort of build a roster around a, a unique skill set that's not perfect, but it, but good enough. Keep in mind how he's the same guy that traded up twice to get Carson Wentz. Okay. And, that, yep. and, and because he saw the classic institutional first round guy. And, and he was rookie of the year until he, you know, blew out his knee that year. I mean, he was playing at a high level. So I, I think Howie Roseman special. He's different. I know Howie really well. Um, and to your point, Eric, um, I still think in today's day, I think there's probably, we can argue about who the franchise quarterbacks are, but there's pro, there's a handful. There's five, six, seven, yeah. whatever max. That second group is the one that intrigues me the most. Okay, like call it seven to 12 or whatever that second group is. To your point, that's the group that if you can build around properly, you can win championships. Okay, but it's really hard because your margin of error goes like this because Patrick Mahomes isn't there to bail you out in the last minute. Yep. Okay, so the margin of error goes down. Um, that's why the Justin Herberts of the world have to become the next guy they have to become. Well, and that's, and that's why guys like, you know, when you guys are building teams, right. That's why when Thomas picks at three and, and, you know, takes Matt, like you're not taking, and, you know, I, I, I always, I'm more sympathetic to the Trey Lance pick than, than a lot of people, even though it didn't work. That's why you don't take Mac Jones at three to your point, like that, you know, the, the uh, rumor pick, because, We've all seen that Mac Jones has significant limitations. So when those perturbations hit the hit the team, right? It's not. Whereas, yeah, Trey Lance was a bust, but like everybody saw Patrick Mahomes there, right? And everybody saw kind of that that potential, and well, that's what you're buying into. I'll tell you this though: not everybody, of course, but but some be some Mahomes, saw. The Mahomes thing's really interesting. I'll, I'll be really honest with you, and you can look this up. When I was doing stuff for NFL Network and had a list of top 100 and all that kind of stuff, I went on the air. And basically said, look, I don't. I've watched every throw Patrick Mahomes made at Texas Tech, every one of them. And I came out of it and I said on the air, he's either going to be a Hall of Fame player or he's going to be out of the NFL in three or four years. And I don't. And I can't tell you which way it's going. I think I put him at like player number thirty on my top hundred because I just didn't. He made so many bad decisions at Texas Tech. 
I can't begin to tell you some of the throws he yeah. had. And the reason he did was he was not on a good football team like Matt Ryan at Boston College, and he was trying to throw guys open, trying to win football games, right? And now Patrick Mahomes, is there, they, they're building statues already. I mean, well, I mean, think about Brett Favre. Brett Favre was a backup behind Chris Miller and Billy Joe Tolliver. Yes. Then he goes and he and and then he obviously gets out of Atlanta and everybody you know uh, Chris Miller made the Pro Bowl the, as far as rookie year so they, they should is critical the fit is critical yeah and Mike Holmgren of course Mike Holmgren should be in the Hall of Fame he he of course developed him and 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 fought with him and everybody remembers the the 1994 game where they were going to put Mark Brunel in and then he decided against it like the whole you know a lot of these these things we live in a threshold world like panda we live in a threshold where like. The difference between, to your point, Hall of Fame and out of the league is not that big, right? And 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 that's obviously you know humbles us as evaluators, you from the scouting side, myself from the analytics side. But it, it it's it is literally that tenuous, and that's why you know that's why a lot of this this stuff is you know you, you really have to pin down uh, you know, what you're looking thing, for and what you're building. The best, the best thing that ever happened to Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, it was Andy Reid. Well, Andy Reid, of course, was in the building with with Brett Favre and, and kind of knows how to, you know, to build a structure around a player. Who... To your point, though, and I apologize for jumping in. I'm getting excited here. To your point, like he ends up with Andy. Andy trades from 31 to 10 or whatever that, those numbers were back, back then. Um, if he ends up at the wrong place, are we talking about Patrick Mahomes today the same way we are if he ends up – I mean – Justin Herbert right now. I mean, I feel I'm, – and I'm not taking any shots anywhere because I'm not yeah. in the building. I, yeah. I'm just saying that's a talented kid. It's a talented and kid. And you feel badly for, for him, and, and he needs to become the, a dude. I completely agree with you on Herbert, yeah. So let, let me ask you this before we leave because I know we're getting closer to 50. Um, Mike, so you and I were talking a little bit earlier. We don't want to go, go in a ton of depth at this. Tis the season. We're getting closer to all the discussions about – Coaching changes, GM changes. There's a lot of that without getting into detail about that. Eric and I have talked ad nauseum about this. Probably people are getting sick and tired of hearing me say it, but there's a lot of there's a lot of nuance to it, right? How how it happens, what's going to happen, who's going to be set up, who's going to be staying with the team, ownership, dealing with ownership. Um, again, without getting specifics, do you think yeah. there are going to be five to seven? complete organizational changes in this league? My message would be this. And there is every year, it seems like, yeah. right? But yeah. my message is really this, is, is that from an ownership perspective, these guys need to understand how critical, critical continuity is in any industry. And if you look at, I, I always like to use the example of the NF, AFC North, and you look at Pittsburgh and you look at Baltimore. Okay, two teams that have minimal turnover amongst their GM and head coach. And even when things aren't as good as they want, the owners stick in there. And by comparison, if you look at the other two teams in that division, they've struggled until recently. Mm -hmm. And why? Because finally they've stuck with people. Okay, they're making decisions. Kevin Stefanski's doing a great job. Barry's doing a great job. Cincinnati has pulled you know Joe Burrow is a big piece but still Cincinnati's doing a great job and to me it comes down to you can't change your head coach and GM every other year and now you're changing scheme now you're changing everything you're you're you just you're changing them. data like how you tag everything how you how you scout players what you're like the big thing like let's let's go underneath the let's go underneath the uh, hood a little bit here the hardest part of our job at Sumer is like we just started a year and a half, two years ago. And so some of our data is only a certain number of uh, years right. long. And so so we don't necessarily know when Mike Mayock slaps a, an 8.7 on a guy like we we don't necessarily know until you've slapped 8.7 on about 10 to 15 players what that really means. And so, again, like you come in, I think about Quasi, you know, Adapo Mensa in Minnesota. He shows up, wants to be the analytics GM, but you've got three months to build a draft model. Yeah, right. Good luck. Right now, you're going to be drafting based upon the guy who was just fired, his grades, right? And like, it, 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 to your point, like we we oftentimes do not appreciate how long. And you get what seven picks a draft on it, like you know, on average yeah. ten uh, at the you know very highest if you're looking at averages. So, you know, does anybody actually know if these guys are like 
Quasi had one draft where literally none of the players hit, and now he's in another draft where literally all the players are pretty good. And so, like, what is he? Is he good or is he bad? And I'm you, you throw your hands up, you say you don't know. And, and that's true about a lot of these guys that get fired. And, and I think what's important for me to ask Mike, and I'll be interested to get your take, can be big picture. I have a strong feeling if I were to sit down respectfully with an ownership group, of 32 owners or whatever it is, I would say – the, the, the responsible thing is to make sure that you are going into your search committee on your next selection of your head coach and or GM and to not just have a couple randos within your building helping you on it, right? The, the search group is vital. I'm not saying many of them have randos. I'm saying there can be ulterior motives within that building of who wants to be a part of bringing someone else in. I have a strong feeling, Eric, and I've, I've told you this before, some owners are being guided by presidents and some of the presidents are great. Some of the presidents aren't involved. Some of the presidents are. But some are saying, well, I don't really want this really, really strong GM and really strong head coach because my presence in the building is going to be minimized, right, as a president. So are they guiding the owner in a different way? I'm not just saying that that's always the way, but I'm saying an owner, respectfully, his responsibility is to look at who his group is and who's looking for what and what the... Are there ulterior motives to have a certain person come in? If the person is coming in, he's going to be the best choice to win games and ultimately a Super Bowl. That's vital, which comes back to me, back back to Bill Belichick. I think Bill Belichick can win a Super Bowl in the next three years for the next team if respectfully he does leave there and goes somewhere else. But you have to be an owner that understands and a president that understands he is coming in as these are. Yep. He's not coming in at anything but that. So my, I guess my point is. I think it's all part of everyone growing and, and learning again. And I think it's really, really important to make sure that the owners are looking at their growing group and who's going to help them pick their coach and their GM and look at it closely and not just look, whimsically look at it. Football is not the core business for most owners. Yeah. Okay. Look, sure. So we're, we're at a point now, and I, I've had this conversation with a bunch of people, and it has to start with the owners. And whether it's a search committee or whatever it is, and you're trying, you've got to define your parameters, what you're looking for. But and every team's a little different. But I'm getting tired of who's the next Sean McVay. Like that's what happens. There's this herd philosophy in the NFL. Like, oh, we have to find the young offensive genius. Okay. And what drives me crazy is what we lose in the translation is what it really does come down to. First and foremost is who's the best leader of men. Okay. I can go buy scheme. I can hire an offensive coordinator who's young and innovative and, and fits what my quarterback is going to do or my vision of a quarterback. But you bet if you don't have the right guy at the top, then none of it, none of the rest of it matters. You know, so we're, we're chasing so hard to find the young offensive minds that I think we're losing track of a lot of really valuable guys to get the job done immediately. Are we chasing also to fill in the young general manager? Because that is another topic of discussion. I think there's a great mix in this league, right, of yeah. mix of young and mix of veteran experience. And I think it depends on the organization, I right? Agree. There may be, I mean, Mr. Tepper may be looking for something as youth, 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 or he may be looking at something else. If, if something happens, he's got to make a decision on that, right? Yeah, I mean, but you don't want to be making that decision every year. No, no, you don't. Which is no, what you're that. doing. That's right. You know, well, and, and to your point, Mike, I think you made a tremendous point, and there's, there's a good um, – uh, comment here. Does Dallas weirdly have a potential edge with Jerry Jones basically running the thing as a family? I, look, yeah. it, I think that that is, you know, we've seen in Carolina, for example, a, a person who has, you know, a very tried and true business uh, acumen trying to run a team like that, had getting having fits and starts. There's also, I mean, football, to your point, is is a game of people and having the people skills and everything like that, especially, and this is this is what gets tricky when the profit motives in the NFL are not tied to winning, right? Like it, it's, it's unlike any other, I mean, uh, Snyder just sold the, the commanders, like made a fortune off of them. And that wasn't a team that necessarily had any success when he was there. And so there, there's this like weird, there's this weird thing where, you know, it really does take a combination of people who have outside ideas because you want to innovate, but you also have to understand the game of football so that you understand how these components work together and how players react to certain changes. And like, even we at Sumer have this, like if we ever do a reorg or something like that, there's always these personal things, there's human things that are not 
necessarily appreciated by people who come from the outside and are not necessarily used to dealing in football. And I know that that comes off as a little like fuddy duddy or whatever, but I do think that that like, there is an element of the footballness to all this that is important to, to actually have a, you know, to actually, you know, put into the, put into the cake. Eric, and the last thing I'll say, and then I can turn it over to you and we can finish off. It's again, I just want to make sure I'm clear on this. The ownership, there are some great owners in this league. There are other owners that are learning along the way. Right. And I think it's imperative back to selection group that they're working with. That's important how they're going to put that together. It's also important that they look and understand there are, other waves of selection process people out there, right? We've, we've seen some great men, Bill Polian, Ernie Accorsi, uh, Ron Wolf. Those people have been vital in helping a lot of teams along the yeah. way. There are also some, some other search people out there who, who, are, who do a great job, who have a fantastic background, who can also fold in and be, be really good for these owners and helping them get to the next spot that they need to get to. Because I mean, look, there are some outrageously intelligent owners, but to Mike's point earlier, their background isn't in football, right? So hopefully they can utilize all their great intelligence and fold in the right football people to help them build the right organization for Super Bowl purposes. Yeah, organizations start, number one, with the owner. And in the NFL, that's often a wild card. Number two, there's a relationship between the head coach and the GM. If the head coach and the GM are not tied at the hip philosophically, you got no chance. It, it, it's hard enough to win when you are tied together, let alone when you're not. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, it's the quarterback. <laughs> Going back yeah. to Eric Scott. I mean, yeah. there's still five or six guys that can help you get to a Super Bowl better than anybody else, and they're quarterbacks. So, yeah. you know, if you're not hitting on all three of those cylinders, then your chances of making it playing in February are very minimal. That's why, that's why I say all the time, I mean, Brett Veach, Brett Veach is a good young general manager. He argues He's with me. Awesome. I'm not, I'm not young anymore. I'm like, no, you're not. You are so talented in what you've done. And he has a trifecta. He's got one of the very best owners in Clark Hunt, one of the very, very best head coaches in Andy and one of the very best quarterbacks. Yeah. It's, Everybody. It's, I always say the quarterback is management. Like whether he wants to be or not, he's part right. of management. Right. Right. And yeah. like yeah. there are, you know, there are some guys who take that on and there are some guys that don't. And, you know, like to your point, Thomas, when you were in Atlanta, like, Matt Ryan was the face of the franchise. He did a lot of stuff, you know, to make sure that that, that, that was true and that and you guys won a lot as a result. Definitely. 100%. This has been this has been a tremendous conversation. We want to thank everybody who's been in the chat, everybody who's listened on Twitter. I think Thomas we're going to set records. We got to we got to send Mike uh another a bonus for that probably uh in, in uh in all honesty. Glass of red wine tonight. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting a glass. Yeah, that's right. That's 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 going to be the the bonus here. But we all want to thank you all for coming. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, tell your friends about the show. Um and uh we'll we'll see you on Wednesday. So, for Mike Mayock, for Thomas Mitchell, this has been Eric Eager. This has been the Sumer Sports Show. <laughs>